sure they had many worries about whether they could make a go of it and whether this community would be a successful community. Much the same worries as probably the organizing committee has had over the last year as to whether the weather would hold, as to whether things would all fall together as beautifully and wonderfully as they have. Before we start this worship service, I would like to again thank you for being here and thank Reverend Crosby for coming to share words with us. And I want you to know, since uh, you're bound to be a little worried, I already told him that you were well used to 45 minute sermons <laughs> and that he shouldn't change one little bit. <laughs> now, there is one other thing, Nimrod. I'm told that over here in Presbyterian history was where the elders sat. Now, in very early Presbyterian churches, you didn't always have music, but the elders would sit over here and line the hymns for the congregation. So, Nimrod, we're expecting great things from you this afternoon. <laughs> Let us come together with our call to worship. If you have a bulletin or if you're near a bulletin,
Owing to the difficulties and disappointments experienced on arrival, no schools or churches were built for three years, but the children were taught and religious meetings were held in private homes or they can log homes because some of the settlers did not stay in their homes. They couldn't cope with their hardships. It was the part that duty of the man of the house to lead the service of worship. Each Sabbath, as all the neighbors gathered, likely to give thanks for survival. And I feel sure to ask help from God in their struggle to endure and to provide daily necessities of life. Ministers were sent on a regular basis to the colony, but the first to stay and work for any length of time among them was Reverend Peter Melville, from whom this church is named. He believed that if the colony was to develop permanent groups, better education and religious services were required. Something better than just spontaneous classes and services held in Lincoln homes. Under his leadership, financial assistance from the home missions was received. And the congregation had saved a small amount of money. At last, it was decided to go ahead with their project. They were going to see about building schools and churches. The meeting was called at Lower Contour, dated August 21st, 1876. The building committee and school trustees were duly appointed from the four districts assembled. Some of the notes that I have tell me that there was Mr. Watt, Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Barclay, Watson. There's more names than that, but I can't think of them now. Uh, they gathered to make the decision. They decided to build four schools, one in each district, Upper Stonehaven, Lower Stonehaven, Upper and Lower Kintour, and they built just one church for the whole colony, at that, to serve the whole colony at that time, and this is the church that they built. Construction began at once. Schools must serve as churches until later. This church was dedicated on January 1st, 1878. On September the 3rd, 1893, the Upper Cantora Church was dedicated. I have no record of the date in which the Lower Cantor Church was dedicated, but surely that record might be somewhere. If anyone knows, I would really appreciate them telling me that because I'd like to keep it among my notes to be passed on in future years. The Lower Cantor, in Lo the Lower Cantor Church is now closed. There never was a church in Bonacore. They worship in the schoolhouse. Mr. Thomas Watt wrote to the Surveyor General, Though we ourselves generally dwell in log homes, yet our schools and our churches must be goodly edifices, better built larger for the convenience of religion and for bigger groups. In 1895, our committee, uh, Mr. Paul, Mr. Adam, Mr. Barkley, Mr. Watt, Mr. Manningham, located and uh, made plans for, uh, located a spot and made plans for building a manse. They organized uh, donations of money, material, and uh, planned labor for the construction. In 1896, a leader from the homeland arrived to occupy the manse and was to be the leader of the churches in the colony for 56 years. And I'm sure you all know who I mean because I too knew Mr. Pringle. And I well remember when we first moved here, our second son was, I guess, the only child ever born up in the house way back in behind the fence. And uh, quite some time before his arrival, Mr. Pringle came over, called my husband outside and told him to be sure to come to his house to call the doctor and say it done. Now, Reverend Dr. Pringle, his ministry was not only one from the pulpit, but also a very personal one that included everyone in the settlement. He soon became a familiar figure on the roads, in winter he traveled with horse and sleigh, and he wore a heavy raccoon fur coat, a fur cap, and an oven heated stone in the bottom of the sleigh to keep his feet from freezing. In summer, he traveled by horse and buggy. The horse, that he you forget, was named Gary, and I don't remember him. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Pringle served this colony until the time of the camp in 1956. This church was at first a Presbyterian Kirk, but in 1925 it was decided to join in the union. 
of the Methodist, Congregational, and Presbyterian. And then this became Melville United Church. Some at first sort of opposed joining in the union, but Mr. Pringle suggested if they didn't, this church would be isolated because all around us, the churches would be united. This would be the only one with Presbyterian. Therefore, the people were persuaded, and I believe that the vote was unanimous. Dr. Pringle's years of service to this community are still remembered with gratitude. He kept detailed records of his congregation and all the happenings in the colony. These are the records which provide us with a detailed history of our church and our community today. There are many others who have served and led his church and congregation. All are worthy of mention. Time doesn't permit it. I'd like to read from the 11th chapter of Hebrews. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive that means as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. Here in our official reading. Join with me, please, and we'll sing hymn number 380. <laughs>
right there. Gap. My purse right there. My purse. Press record button. Yeah, that's what I meant.
Nova Scotia, and it's from actually one of the uh, songs from the Dr. Helen Creighton collection of folk songs from Nova Scotia. <clears throat> hey, it also happens to be in our first album. Isn't that a coincidence? <clears throat> oh, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs>
Well, this next song we're going to do is... Uh, well, it tells a very, very poignant and tragic story, a true story of uh, how a young man came over in the uh, early part of this century to, from Prince Edward Island to work in the lumber woods. He uh, left home when he was about uh, 16, and uh, shortly after he arrived here in the Boys Town area, he met his tragic death in an accident up in the woods. As he was being uh, carted out of the woods in very, very excruciating pain, he told his story and rambled on of how he loved Prince Edward Island and his family and his father and how he was going to miss them. The, uh, shortly, after, shortly after getting out uh, of the woods and actually about two days after he, uh, he met his accident, he, he died at the home of a gentleman who brought him out of the woods, a fellow by the name of John Calhoun. John Calhoun wrote a poem about this young man and, and his ramblings. And as was the thing to do in the day, he took the uh, poem to a friend of his to put a tune to it. The young man is buried in the uh, graveyard, which is almost across the road from the central New Brunswick um, Woodsman's Museum in the Boys Town area. And if you're ever up there, just go across the road and up, up the little knoll into the graveyard and look off to the right, and you'll see a headstone there that's with the name Peter Emberley. My name is Peter Amberley, as you might understand. I was born in Prince Edward, I hear, and down by the ocean. Where is it? Is my mom Uncle Al? You gotta, you gotta flip it over, right? Is she? Yeah. Oh, no. Move, Matt. That's my mom's camera, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It was two fives, and, and then the guy who got 12. Him up a little more. I made him run there a little while ago. No, there wasn't another the five. Like he was off, the other guy was off by more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice view from up here, a little Marcel Mountain sticking out there, Dan. Yeah, it is really nice.
outside the church? Yeah. I'll get your picture there. Other people. 
Quite the fish you caught. Hail the Bonnie of Scotland. Hello there, Ruby. <laughs> Good. Lovely day for a play. Hilton, play a Wilf Carter tune. <laughs> don't go too far, Melissa. Don't go too far. I'm all in there, Lily's the candy and get blown. Hello! 
That's a beautiful headstone of your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, now us. <laughs> that whole family, the Greg look, that whole family, they moved here and they all died. Really? They all moved, they moved here and they didn't make hard any of them. Oh, that's good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There was 195 children under the oh. under 12 years old that came over on the first boat, uh, and there was one born on the uh, on the boat, and uh, her name was Castell. Name she was named Castalia Butler Ferguson Brown Morrison <laughs> for several reasons. Butler, there's uh, all those people were were on the boat, and uh, that was what I was thinking. They arrived in St. John, New Brunswick on May the 10th, 1973, and they'd sailed on April, so it was about a 15-day trip over. From St. John, they made their way up to Kilburn. Uh, uh, it was tough. New difficulties occurred, of course. The, they found that the land, the land was not quite ready up here. The, some of the houses were not built, and they said to the, you know, they, advised the ladies and the, the women and the children that uh, they should maybe stay behind and they come a little later. But anyway, uh, the ladies being pretty strict in their own ways of doing things, they said, no, they say, we only, um, gang, I will, we'll come along and we'll go. So they did, and it was pretty rough, there's no doubt about it. Uh, they were, there was, first of all, you know, they were surprised to probably, and this is in May, and they were surprised to find a foot of snow up in where they eventually landed in Bonacourt. 
However, they had a lot of work to do. Much encouragement was given you to continue on, and after much work, a total of 543 settlers uh, had settled in. More came, of course, the following year in 1984, which again went into Contour and Upper Contour on the Sidonia. So the population grew. Some returned, some went back to St. John, but on the, the majority stayed and, uh, and worked hard. The first three years were difficult, hard years, with no schools and churches were built and crops were sown between the stumps, but they were, they were tough. Children were taught at home, uh, church meetings held in the houses. A great deal of support was given by the Presbyterian Church, of course, of, uh, of New Brunswick. And uh, arranging baptism, temporary ministers to fill in, giving services and communion as required. Uh, it's interesting to know, though, that even though there was no, you know, there was no permanent ministers here, that I think for the first two and a half years there was uh, 40 children baptized in the Scotch colony, which was really something. In for the, fir our fir the first minister came to the colony in November of 1875. This was a uh, this was a man sent from God. Uh, they called him a man to match the mountains. The Reverend Peter Melville arrived. A very, he was a very organized person who led the colonists into a very active church life. And in August of 1876, Mr. Peter Melville's plan was to, he laid it all out. He had a plan to build four schools, houses without delay, one for each colony, and also to build a church at the junction of the roads, which, which is still there now. The four schoolhouses were opened in the year of 1877. And the one in the Scotch colony here, the one in Kincardine and the one in Contour, the one in Kincardine, I know, and the one in Contour, both open, open tomorrow, so you can win. And uh, Darlene and uh, they've done a lot of work to restore those, and they've painted the outside, and they really look nice. And if you'd like to go in there, you might Pick further, might be able to further your education from where you picked up, picked up quite a few years ago. <laughs> I went there for eight years, and uh, I can't keep telling my grandchildren about going there for eight years, and they wondered why I stayed in grade, one grade eight years. <laughs> it's pretty tough. But I never did learn too much, but what I did learn, I learned it there. <laughs> And then, of course, the schools were used for, you know, they were used for uh, Sunday schools and all community activities. Uh, the church was completed on January the 1st, 1878, and was dedicated and named the Melville Church, of course, after Peter Melville. The cost of the church at that time uh, was $1,025. You know, I mean, that was a bargain, I think. But the church building uh, with the final payment was, was made in, in 1878. It was fantastic, you know, really. Uh, in May, unfortunately, in 1978 in May, Reverend Peter Melvin accepted a call to Stanley and Nashwalk, so he left here at this area. During the period from 1878 to 1896, the Melville Church was serviced by several ministers until June of 1896 when the Reverend Gordon Pringle accepted a call to be a uh, minister at, the, uh, at a salary of $500 a year. And this is when I started coming into the picture because I remember, uh, now that was, now that, that was 1896, that's quite a while back, but, 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 but as, as, as Mr. Pringle grew older, I grew older, and we that's where I sort of came into the picture. Good or bad. I don't know whether I had any influence on him or not, but... Uh, he, he had served as a missionary also earlier. He came in for a period in between time just to serve as a, for a short time. And uh, during which, at that time, the upper, actually the upper contour of, his plan, of the church was planned and built in 1893. A mansion and a mansion in the barn was also built during the period, which of course is one of the historic buildings on the colony today. And then I guess we'll be touring those too. 
Uh, Lower Contour Church was dedicated in 1909. Reverend Gordon Pringle's ministry over a period of 1896 to 1951 was well served during a period of <coughs> during a period uh, which saw you know, it saw fantastic attendance at the churches. It was great attendance. Everybody went to church because everywhere that's that's where the uh, that's where the uh, community work was done. A very close, hard-working group of colony people who survived two world wars by doing their part both home and overseas. And as Catherine Warman points out in her article she has written uh, some time ago, uh, that as with. Uh, with sadness, the nine, nine people from Bonacord alone went overseas and four didn't come back. That was Bonacord alone. And then, of course, the other colonies had their own people, too, that uh, were in the First and Second World War. Uh, and I know, I know some of those. I know, for instance, George McConnell, for one, was served in both World Wars. If you read the history of the Scotch colony, 1873 to 1969, which I'm sure you probably have, and by the way, it's now been it's now been carried on, and they've enlarged the the book, and they've extended it on to the recent times now, and it's supposed to be it's being sold here, so it's it's a worthwhile article to have. Uh, a lot of you have, it's I'm sure I've read it. It is outstanding and unbelievable the number of people who served as elders and deacons and the length of time they served. You know, uh, like Jimmy Fa James Parker, 46 years. John Drop, 37 years, serving uh, as deacons and elders. John Hutchison for 50 years. And the list goes on and on and on. And as you read the book, you see that. The organists who served, right up to recent times. The Sunday school teachers, the school teachers who served. Uh, I can remember my first school teacher, Dorothy Farker. She's probably here today. And uh, that's, uh, I, I think that's where I really learned. Two years she was there, grade one and two. That's really when I started to learn. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happened. I lost interest. And, and I think I had to sit beside Helen, and that wasn't good because she'd keep copying off my work. <laughs> The volunteers who served, you know, and still serve, like back in those days, Mrs. J.B. Adams, uh, they had a store in Bonacourt. Uh, she was sort of a community doctor, and she was a midwife. You know, when, when many of the children were born, and everyone called her the Scottish equivalent of mother. School board and counselors, Jim Barkley. You know, I, I remember Jim Barkley. He was always gone. You know, and I could never figure out why he was going so fast, but he was always gone. And uh, but man, that he was just he done so much service for these uh, these communities. He recalls uh, the Upper Contour Church was dedicated in 1893, and and uh, he says, of course, I was the first baby to be baptized in that church. So now coming to my time, I remember things that my children don't really believe. You know, like for. Telephone, for example, uh, they say in the book here that, uh, in, in the book, history book, in January of 1913, well, they hooked up a telephone. Well, I never seen that, and we never seen that up our way until 1952, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> and uh, that was right after my second life. My first life was in 19, 1951, I think it was. Uh, Bernard Hargrove come up and wired her house and they turned the lights on. I thought I was born again. <laughs> the lights all went on. Following that, the telephone, the telephone was hooked up and uh, they only had two numbers. But I think it went to, down to Davison's is where it went and they had it in the manse too. So, that's the way it goes. They tell the people working for a dollar and 75 cents an hour, which was a lot, and it's maybe enough nowadays, you never know. But uh, they, 
Johnny Ellis. Uh, he, he, this is what he built the Bobby Burns Hall for. He had a contract and, uh, to build it. He worked at $1.75. The first mill, for instance, the first mill that Frazier's had was in Bonacord. Nobody probably realizes that, but uh, Donald Frazier and uh, Johnny Drum set it up. And uh, I, I'll, I'll always remember uh, people like uh, Aunt Jean Drum. She was, uh, uh, she lived in Bonacore, but uh, I, I spent a lot of time up there and I, we never had plowed roads in those days and, and Helen and I'd have to walk home from school. Big fright, but <laughs> Catherine Warman, I never, never, I can never forget Catherine and Herbie Warming living in Bonacore and the flower gardens that she had, just beautiful. Russell Hargrove, I, I, I worked for Russell and he learned me how to drive tractor, I'll never forget that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, Mrs. Matheson, of course, she gathered everybody down there in the school and had a mission band. And uh, my grade one teacher, as I mentioned before, Dorothy Parker, I've got to give her a lot of credit because <laughs> I'd never be where I was today if it wasn't for her. But, <clears throat> but I could go on and uh, I could go on and on and on about you know I could go on and on but there's things that happened and uh, I even today I have people I I of course have a place up the road uh, towards Bonacord there we still have the family farm and uh, we come up there and. Over the years, I brought a lot of people up here. Uh, like, we live in Nova Scotia now. But I bring people up here all the time to visit here. And it was summertime, they used to start coming, and we would, uh, they would spend a week or so here, and uh, then they'd go back home, and they'd call me up and say, when are we going back up here? So everybody I brought up here wants to come back and now it's starting to be winter time they want to come up here in January and February now they come up here snowmobiling and whatnot and right now they're back there planning to come again this winter you know so the Scotch colony is a very very beautiful very beautiful place the hills of, of uh, the colonies Montpelcourt both contour lower and upper and uh, and uh, all around here and you can't blame them while they want to come back and and I am sure that this weekend you will probably meet a lot of people, you'll see a lot of things, and you'll really, I really hope that you enjoy yourself. And uh, the, idea of the, the idea of the anniversary, of course, is, is to talk to people, get to know people. And there'll be things going on all day, a barbecue here. There'll be things in the Burns Hall tonight, and of course the church service tomorrow. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to go back to the agenda here now. If it wasn't for Dorothy Farker, I'd never be able to read this. <laughs> but uh, I've got to make a couple of notations here. Just There's donation boxes at the gate. I'm going to read the names of the First World War veterans and uh, the Second World War ones. And... Uh, any other ones, and if I should happen to miss someone, it's not intentional. I'm reading it from the new book, The History of the Scots Colony, and uh, it's the updated version. And uh, I'll put a little plug in like Ken did. They are for sale. At... So uh, I'll start reading from the First World War Veterans. You're all right? The uh, veterans of the First World War, John McClellan, William Paul, Alexander Mackay, Alexander Drum, George Sheriffs, Alexander Sheriffs, Malcolm Adam, Chester McPhail, Lawrence McPhail, John Taylor, William McConnell, James Watt Robertson, Angus McDonald. Miss Jean Drum says that this was the First World War. This was a real disruption in the colony life in the First World War. World War II, 1939 to 45. 
Alexander J. Clark, Anna A. Clark, Bruce Clark, Ian A. Clark, Robert Clark, Gordon DeMerchant, Philip DeMerchant, Duncan McPhail, Alex R. Masterson, Cecil Perkins, Leonard C. Riddle, Philip A. Smith, some of these veterans are still living and are still with us. We're just honoring all of them today. Angus Stevenson, Gordon J. Stevenson, Ronald E. Stevenson, Gordon Adam, and from the Upper Kintour, Andrew Phillips, James Phillips, Angus D. Stevenson, Lloyd E. Patterson, Roy Anderson, and killed in action as well with many of the others, James Arthur Gordon. Upper Kintour sent 10 sons to World War II. Harry Kinney, Alexander Christie, Milton Corey, Louis DeMerchant, Richard DeMerchant, Lawrence Mulberry, Joseph Farquhar, Arthur Smith, Mac McFarland Williamson, Thomas Williamson, Thomas Williamson Jr. and Thomas Williamson Sr. And those gentlemen, all the, the last ones I read, all returned safely from the Second World War. Many of them have probably passed on now. Lower Kintour soldiers. John Hartko, War I. John McClellan, War I. James W. Robertson, War, War I. Second World War, Philip LaPaz, Hayden Davenport, Philip McQuaid, George Rideout, Morris G., Robert Patterson, Loomis McQuaid, Herbert G., Hilton Rideout, Benjamin Davenport, killed in the Korean War, Hayden Davenport. Now, if I have inadvertently missed someone, please forgive us for that. This is, the, uh, this is a copy of the new history of the colony, and as I said before, they are available. Melvin Barkley is selling them, and they're well worth having. There's a lot of interesting reading in them. Thank you. Bye. Okay, moving right on. We're, uh, I'm told I'm moving on schedule. I can't be back.